Why does KB Lake X exist? That's the question we asked Intel at their press day. It's not compatible with LGA 1151. It works with more expensive motherboards and half of the components on the board will go unused. For example, four of these DIMMs you can't use with KB Lake X and then part of the PCIe devices as well if you're planning to populate them. So those features aren't free to the consumer. You pay for all the stuff on the board, but the CPU can't drive them. So it ends up in a very weird part of the market. We asked Intel about why this product exists and why it's 2066 and not 1151. We'll have an answer for you in a moment. But if you look under the die, even the top part of the substrate looks pretty familiar. So we're not fully convinced that this product needs to exist in the package it does, but we're gonna be here reviewing it anyway, looking through thermals, gaming performance, and more. Before getting to that, this video is brought to you by ifixit.com and the PC Essentials Toolkit, which can be had for $20, making it one of their cheapest yet most complete toolkits. Use code GAMERSNEXUS for $5 off to bring that to 15. You can go to ifixit.com slash GAMERSNEXUS or click the link below for more information. Getting into this thing, Intel's answer to our query, which was why does this KB Lake X exist, was that it allows consumers to get into the high-end desktop platforms, X299 at a lower price point so that they can upgrade later to the higher end CPUs. This we think is a little misguided, but that was their answer. There are a few things we could speculate from here, but first of all, the misguided part Here's the thing, if you're spending $330 anyway on a CPU, which is functionally the same as a 7700K, except for actually they've stripped out the IGP, but otherwise functionally the same, once you're at $330 on the CPU, you're kind of out of territory where you're going to throw it away or even just move it to another build and buy a different one later. Because if you're spending 300 bucks on this and 300 plus on a board, might even end up with a board that's more expensive than the CPU in this series of of chipset and platform, once you are there, it's time to stop pretending and go properly high-end. This chip, an i7-7740X, is considered low-end when coupled with something like this. And the 7700K, which is what this is, really isn't a low-end processor. It's not. But when you pair it with one of these, it becomes a low-end processor and the pairing doesn't make any sense. This is especially true for the i5-7640X, which we will probably not be reviewing because it also, it definitely shouldn't exist. That one we know for sure should not be a CPU you can buy for this. So one or the other, uh, either you have high-end CPUs for high-end boards or you fill both audiences, which is kind of what the existing i7 line does. So that's, that's the positioning for these platforms. And it's, it's not a mid-step, it's just weird. This isn't like the G4560 where it might make sense to buy it with a Z270 board and upgrade in a year. No, it's, it's a bit worse than that because you're spending so much money on the motherboard and half the features are unusable. More realistically, we think that Intel is trying to work toward merging its high-end enthusiast products. By eighth generation, we wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing things like the 7700K equivalent chips move permanently to X-Class hardware, at least if there's not enough pushback but that answers why Intel thinks KB Lake X exists. Of course, shows that we don't necessarily agree, but it's just ultimately more confusing for end users. As for the differences between the 7700K and the 7740X, here's a chart that shows them. Don't look too hard because there's really not many differences. It's the base frequency. That's the one the 7740X climbs to 4.3 gigahertz from 4.2 with boost at 4.5 on both. And they're still using dual channel memory controllers despite being on the X series platform. So again, only four DIMMs are populable. And also they're still both limited to 16 PCIe lanes on the CPU itself. The last major difference is that the socket type changed. It's 2066, a few things with this. The X series chipsets are more expensive for the producer of the motherboard, which means it's more expensive for you, and the socket's more expensive, just like AMD's Threadripper socket's more expensive. It's more metal, so it costs more money. So the socket type changes, you can't use one of these with the Z-series platforms, otherwise this might make a little more sense as just a standard refresh, nothing wrong with a 100 megahertz bump, but it's a little worse than that, obviously, because we're looking at a new motherboard. One more big change, though. The IGP, again, is gone. So this is where Intel's argument gets a little nebulous because they have said uh, the intention of these CPUs is to buy it 
discard it or relocate it, and then put a better CPU in the system with the intention being to upgrade later. If your intention is to upgrade later, why not provide an IGP? If I'm the type of person who's going to upgrade a CPU later, then I probably might want to just sit around and wait to buy a video card too, in which case an IGP would make this more arguable for Intel. You can't do that here though. There's no means of troubleshooting. And look, we don't normally like the IGPs. We don't even talk about them in the reviews of the KSQ parts. But the reason it's being talked about now is because it was removed and I'm not sure there was a functional reason to do so. So it does just kind of seem weird and it's not like the price went down for the consumer. If this CPU were $30 cheaper than the 7700K, that kind of makes sense. And then you could at least mentally tell yourself, okay, it, I'm saving $30 on the CPU so I can invest 30 more on the motherboard or something like that. But that's not how it works here. That should largely outline our stance on the CPU. Let's look at the benchmark numbers, starting with thermals. And as always, you can find our full testing methodology linked in the description below. For thermals here, we're using a Kraken X62, completely maxed out on the fans and the pump. We've used this for our thermals for some time now. And we're also logging liquid temperature, which allows us to look at the delta between the liquid temperature, the CPU package, and the CPU cores, so we can figure out how well the CPU die is transferring its heat to the IHS and then into the cooler. Starting with just the 7740X and its stock configuration with an AVX workload, we found that the CPU tended to operate around 1.77 vCore when auto vCore was used on our ASUS Prime board, and it does change per board. And that was with a CPU temperature peaking at around 75 to 76 Celsius on the package, or about 74 to 75 C for a peak averaged core temperature. In this time, our liquid temperature only increases from about 29 or 30 C to about 35 C for a delta of about 6 C start to end of the test. The last time we showed this data was for the 7700K review, when we noted that the 7700K was running pretty hot even compared to its 6700K predecessor. Part of this seems to be that there's poor transfer from the CPU die to the IHS and the cooler, as the liquid temperature doesn't really move all that much, even when testing it for an hour. And again, this is with a Kraken X62 maxed out, and we're still around 74 to 75 C. So this CPU runs hot. If we were to drop the fan speed to around 1050 RPM, which is pretty bearable, and you can see in our CPU cooler testing, the temperatures would rise substantially to the point where it really wouldn't be worth dropping the fan speed and less powerful coolers wouldn't be as effective. Comparing now to the overclocked version of the CPU at 5.1 gigahertz with a V-core of 1.37, we're looking at a temperature that's bumping into the 100 Celsius TJ max limiter, causing severe clock drops that bring down our OC. The chip can clearly handle it, but we need a lot more than even a 280 millimeter cooler with maxed out fan and pump RPMs in a room with an ambient of about 22 to 23C. So it's, again, pretty hot. We just weren't stable below 1.37 volts, and at least with the 5.1 gigahertz clock for AVX instructions, but we were stable at 1.35 for non-AVX instructions. The next interesting comparison will be between the 7700K and the 7740X. This is the last one we're publishing for now, but we do have a lot more data to dig into for some future content. For this comparison, both CPUs are clocked to 4.5 gigahertz with a 1.2 volt V core, and we're running non-AVX thermal tests to compare the non-AVX thermals between the CPUs. They're roughly the same when at the same voltage, 1.20 volts, with about a 68 to 70 Celsius range. Most differences in thermals between the two CPUs can be attributed to motherboard changes, primarily motherboard auto V-core that might run a higher voltage on one socket than the other. More thermal discussion in the link in the description below, as always. But now we're gonna move on to FPS tests. Before getting to these, this CPU, again, is basically a 7700K, so we're going to be comparing it primarily to a 7700K to show when and if there are differences. Because of that, there won't be a lot of discussion comparing it to other parts, and that's not because we hate the other parts, it's because they were compared against already in our Ryzen 5 review. So if you would like to see discussion on the non-77XX parts, then check the R5-1600X review and check the i9-7900X review for the most up-to-date data and comparison on all of those. Today, it's a focus on the 277 blank chips, 100K and 40X, so that we can see how these scaling looks and if it's worth putting the 7700K on a $300 plus dollar motherboard. Let's look at Blender next. The i7-7740X stock CPU completes our scene render in 42 minutes, which is basically the same as the i7-7700K's 42.4 minute result. 
basically the same. Overclocking the 7740X gets us to 37.1 minutes for an improvement in performance of about 13% over baseline. Then again, you shouldn't buy either of these CPUs for Blender rendering anyway. It's just a good tool to look at the difference between them. If rendering is the primary goal, the R7 1700 would do significantly better at 33 minutes and would cost the same, and then you could overclock it. Granted, the i7 series CPUs do tend to hold an advantage in gaming, but we'll get there. Looking at Firestrike next, the 7740X runs a physics frame rate of 46.49 FPS with the 7700K stock CPU at 45.96 FPS. This is within test to test variance actually and isn't really a significant difference. Overclocking gets us to 52.44 and 52.16 FPS on the X and K SKUs respectively, both at 5.1 gigahertz. So again, the same. Sorting by physics scores instead shows us the same thing. The 7740X with its 14,645 score is about 1.2% ahead of the 7700K. With TimeSpy, it's more of the same. The 7740X stock CPU runs a CPU frame rate of 20 FPS with the 7700K stock CPU at 19.66 FPS for the same test. That's a 1.7% difference. Overclocking gets us to 21.88 FPS versus 21.4 FPS on the 7700K OC CPU. Ashes of the Singularities are our next synthetic test with DX12 and puts the 7740X stock CPU at 42.4 FPS for our 1080p high test with lows at 33.9 and 31 FPS 0.1%. The 7700K runs its average at 41.5 FPS lows, 32.7 and 30.91 1 and 0.1%. That puts the 7740X at 2% ahead of the 7700K CPU, a little bit boring there. So we'll move on to Ash's Escalation, which we haven't fully updated with all our CPUs yet, but it does have the 7700K stock CPU at 44.3 FPS average, 36.4, 1% lows, and 33.2, 0.1% lows. The 7740X is measurably but imperceptibly better at 44.8 FPS average, or 1.1% faster. This change, like all the others, could largely be chalked up to the fact that even just the motherboards are different, so there might be differences in things like DPC latency and other aspects of the board. Grand Theft Auto 5 isn't much difference. The stock 7740X measured at 149 FPS average with 108 FPS 1% lows, with the 7700K stock CPU at 149. The two overclocked SKUs are different by less than one FPS and are within test-to-test -test variants. They are effectively identical. There are more gaming results in the article. Normally, we would go through at least one or two more of them here, considering Ashes is basically synthetic. But to save you the time, they're all the same. The difference between these CPUs is barely there at all. Sometimes the 7700K is in the lead in some of the games. Sometimes this one's in the lead. And when I say in the lead, I mean the bar is bigger, but that doesn't mean that it's outside of test variants. And there's plenty of differences just in the motherboards. For example, the maturity of this chipset X299 is not quite as far along as Z270. So there are instances where we saw improved performance on the 7700K Z270 platform than on this one even though they're technically the same clock. And some of that is the chipsets being different, some of it is the maturity of the drivers, but at the end of the day, they will come out to be about the same FPS, so no point in going through more of it. As for the conclusion on this CPU, the i7-7740X, it's very plain and simple. This isn't worth buying, do not buy it. Uh, if you want to buy a CPU that is really gaming focused from Intel, the 7700K with a Z270 makes a lot more sense. The CPUs themselves are the same price. Let's say that this CPU were somehow attainable or obtainable on the Z270 platform. If you could get one of these on Z270, would it be worth buying? Well, probably not. It depends, but ultimately, even if they were on the same platform and they cost the same price and they were both being sold alongside one another, what you end up with is a 100 megahertz faster base, totally irrelevant for most of us because if you're gaming, it's probably going to be pinned at 4.5 anyway, and that's the same on both of them, and you lose the IGP, and technically the TDP rating on this is higher on this one than the other. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe the base clock pushes it the extra 20 or so watts, or maybe they're just accounting for the high temperature scenarios that the 7700K exhibited. But either way, the only real difference is that IGP and 100 megahertz on the base. So uh, it's not worth buying. It's a waste of money to get it for the X299 platform. If you want to buy the X299 platform, there are some really good motherboards out there.
putting this on it would just really be an insult to the boards. So if you go X299, get a good board for it and then get a decent CPU for it. It doesn't have to be a 10 core, but something better than these so that you can actually use everything on the board and then, uh, then you have a platform that might be worth using. There are still some reasons that X299 isn't perfect. We talk about those in the 7900X review. AMD gives them quite a run for their money in the consumer department where you might be rendering in Blender or whatever as a freelancer or a semi-professional or someone who doesn't work for a large studio where you'll have workstations with Intel products. But for most of our audience, things like rendering, Ryzen is quite good at it. For things like gaming, the 7700K is as good as this on a cheaper platform and it's way more streamlined and less confusing with more mature drivers, a more mature chipset and the driver support from the motherboard vendors. And they've gone through all of their revisions to fix all the problems with the first round of boards. So that's the best way to go. If you don't want to screw around with things and you just want to play games with a high frame rate and that's it. So uh, that's all for this one. As always, links in the description below for more information. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And then store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt. Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.